rooms. What I will do, I'm going to give a presentation on the topic, which today is why should we pray? I'll give a presentation on it. Then we'll go through the lesson. And last time we were really pushing to get through the material, uh, and we didn't have much time for discussion. And I'd like to have a little time for discussion if any of you have questions on a particular lesson that we're through for that day. So I'll give a presentation for a bit, and then we'll take time with the lesson, and it'll be on the screen as before. Now everyone have lesson one? Looks like we're good there. Okay. I think that's all I got. <laughs> so let's um, let the folks come right on in. You know there are um, several things that are very foundational to our experience as a Christian and not only individually but as a church one is the Word of God of course the Bible this is more than likely why you became a Christian because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to God's Word so that's very foundational to be a Christian also prayer which is the subject of our series another is the baptism of the Holy Spirit you hear me talk about that a lot and the Baptist Holy Spirit plays a major role in our prayer life. And we'll have a lesson on that. And righteous by faith, which is so absolutely necessary for us to learn how to let Jesus live out his life in us. That's in essence what righteous by faith is. So those four things, the Word of God, prayer, Baptist Holy Spirit, righteous by faith. Those are very essential to our, our relationship with God. And I would add also to that fellowship. Because, you know, we haven't had this kind of fellowship for a while. Because we had camp meetings and some other things. And I don't know how you are. I, I, I get a unique blessing out of us coming together. So Christian fellowship is an important part of our, our walk with the Lord too. So those are essential ingredients. And... Um, Today, uh, we want to focus on why should we pray? And when we think about prayer, really, prayer is the most powerful force on earth. Amen. I don't know if you thought of it that way, but it's true. Prayer is the most powerful force on earth. And there's a reason for that, because it releases the Holy Spirit to do what God wants to do. And it releases the power of God's Word. Without prayer, there, there won't be the power of the Holy Spirit that God would like, and the, His Word will not have the impact in this world and in our life. Now, I know when I first became a Christian, you know, you, you realize, well, God is God, and He's sovereign, and He can kind of do what He wants to do, you know. Um, so why should we pray? We might think, Prayer is more of a privilege, and it is a privilege, but we may think, well, it may not be really necessary because God's sovereign, he's gonna do what he wants to do. Um, but the truth is, as we're gonna to see today, is that God has made himself dependent on us praying to do what he wants to do. And you see that from the very creation of this world. You read in Genesis, when God created us as that he made man in his image. We're in the image of God. We were created as much like God as a created being could be. Very much like God. And in that sense, we, mankind, and Adam, of course, in the beginning, Adam and Eve, they were to be God's representative on earth. You see, it wasn't be God coming down and doing everything. No. God put man here to do everything in God's stead. Amen. Man was to be God's representative on planet Earth. So everything that God wanted to do was to be done through mankind. And that's what he said. He gave them dominion. Remember that word in Genesis? Dominion means they were to be the ruler here. They were to have authority here. And you can see that same idea in, in Psalm chapter 
8 verse 5 where it says, He crowned man with glory and honor. And if you look at those words in the Hebrew, glory and honor, they're words used to describe a reigning king over his domain. So man was crowned with glory and honor. Man was given dominion. He was to be as like king in that, in that sense. In God's stead, serving God. He was to be the one in authority on planet Earth. So what happened on Earth was dependent on Adam. It was that actually complete. In fact, the authority given to Adam was so complete that he could give it away. And we know the story. That when Adam yielded to Satan and he yielded to the temptation, he gave over to Satan the authority in this world that God had given Adam. Well, <clears throat> that's why when you read in such verses as John 12, 31, it says, Christ speaking, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You see, Satan called the prince of this world. Again, a princely authority. And another text is 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world has blinded the mind. So he's called the God of this world. And the reason for that, Adam gave to Satan the authority, God, God gave to Adam the authority and Adam gave to Satan that authority. So Satan became the prince, the God, the one in authority on this earth. Now, as I said, from the beginning, it was God's plan to work through man, not independent of him. That's a very important concept. His plan has always been to work through man and not independent of him. That is why Christ had to become human. Christ had to become a man. Because this world was lost through Adam, the man whom God had given authority to. This world could only be won back by a man. And when you're reading Romans 5, he's called the second Adam. Christ becoming human and winning this world back. And you, there's a text here in Romans 5, verse uh, 19. For as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners. That's Adam in it. So by the obedience of one shall many, 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 many be made righteous. So as you read through Romans 5, and you might want to do that later, you'll see the contrast are between Adam and between Christ. And what Adam lost, Christ gained. And that's why the cross was such a victory. He, several aspects of Christ's life, his perfect obedience and victory over Satan, and also the victory of the cross and in the resurrection. And if you want to find an interesting chapter, you go to Romans, I mean Revelation 5. And Revelation 5 pictures the Father holding up the deed to this world. And there's weeping and wailing because nobody's found worthy to take it. It's lost. And then finally, Christ is able to take it. And there's great praise. There's a crescendo of praise there. And right there is a symbolic vision that John had again of the world was lost no man could take it, no one found worthy, but then the lamb as it had been slain is what the expression used there. Christ was able to take it back. So absolutely important that's why Christ's victory <coughs> without that Satan would be the ruler and there'd be no hope. Now what's that got to do with prayer? Well, that Christ has won this world back. And there was prayer in the Old Testament, no question about it. But the Holy Spirit has become more available in the New Testament. Remember the day of Pentecost? 
And so there's in, in some ways a greater power on earth today available because of what Christ won, won back. Satan is no longer the god of this world. He's no longer the prince of this world. Christ is the king of kings and lord of lords. So, when it comes to prayer, when God wants to do something, it's necessary for us to ask him to do it. Because remember the principle, God's plan from the beginning was to work through man, not independent of him. So not, God's not going to go and do a bunch of independent stuff. He needs us to ask him. Now, how do I know that? Well, let's look at some scriptures. Like in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, the Lord's Prayer. You know, he says, Our Father which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth. As it is in heaven. Now, think about that. Why do we have to ask God? And it is a prayer, right? It's a prayer Christ talks. Why did Christ say we must ask God's will to be done on earth? Because it won't be. Unless we ask. See, that's not meaningless words. There's a, a significant principle there. We need to ask that God's will be done because that releases God to carry out His will. Now we have some examples of that. In Matthew chapter 9, Christ is looking over the people and their need. And he, he, he feels their need. And he says, look, the harvest is great. Remember that text? Yeah. But what? The laborers are few. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are there few laborers? God is sovereign. Why didn't he send the laborers? What did Jesus tell the disciples to do? Pray. For laborers. Why do they have to pray for laborers? Because that's the only way there would be laborers. So, as a church, if we needed certain individuals in this church to do, you know, laborers to carry out certain parts of God's work, well, a good starting place is ask God to bring them. Ask God to bring to our, our church what's needed, because He knows what's needed, because that enables Him to do that. Also, Paul said another one in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.1. Paul, here's his request. Pray for us that the word of God may have free course and be glorified. So there is again. Paul recognized, I need your prayers in order to do the work God's called me to do. Then you've got James 5, which Elijah, back in the time of Ahab, remember they were in such sin that... Um, uh, you know, God in the Old Testament would withhold rain if they turned away from God. And God said there's going to be a drought. And remember what Elijah had to do? You read about it in James 5 verse 17. He had to pray. He prayed there'd be no rain. Then after three and a half years, God told Elijah, go to Ahab and tell him it's going to rain. He did. And what did he have to do? He had to pray. And you remember this, what he had to do this time? Seven times. It's not just one prayer. We're going to have a lesson specifically on persevering prayer. That's very important. Sometimes we don't understand that like perhaps we should. We're going to have one lesson on that. Uh, but he had to keep praying. And it's fascinating. Ellen White said this. Had he given up in discouragement at the sixth time, his prayer would not have been answered. But he persevered till the answer came. Now, I don't know. That. That's found in uh, S.D.A. Bible Commentary, Volume 2, page 1034. I don't understand exactly what, but here's what I think goes on. You've got the powers of evil. And you've got the powers of God. They're real, right? Because at church, I'm going through the, uh, the armor of God. We'll be doing our, our second presentation this Sabbath on the armor of God. You know, Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood and so forth. So there's a warfare going on behind the scenes. You and I don't see it. It's there. So there's the power of evil and the power of God. So there's this conflict going on. Well, what I see happening, the more we pray, the more the power of God 
is there. Where if we don't pray, then it can go the other way. I had one experience one time. Uh, this was my second church district, and the church was divided over an issue. And we had a church business meeting over it, and there were some pretty heated feelings. And, you know, I'm there at the business meeting as a young pastor, and I hadn't been in this situation before, but I knew I better pray. And I was sitting there kind of chairing the meeting, and you know how you quietly pray also? I had never experienced this before. As I would pray, things tended to go okay. But when I got kind of weary and let up, I could sense it started to go the other way. I actually feel it. Feelings get a little more intense. I get back to praying again. So it's real. And, and so prayer then releases, as I said, releases the Holy Spirit, releases the power of God that wouldn't be released otherwise. And we've got a, another example over here in Ezekiel 22, beginning verse 29. He says, the people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy. They wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So this is Ezekiel. This is just when the Israel is going to go off into Babylonian captivity. They were really messing up, in the sin, disobeying God. Then notice verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. So what's he saying here? God has a justice side. And when there is sin, it is demanding justice, just retribution. God's justice come. God's wrath come. And he said, but you know, he has a mercy side. God doesn't want to bring his judgments. He wants to be merciful. That's his primary characteristic, if you look at the character of God. He wants to be merciful. And so he's saying, I look for a man, someone that I could find and the implication here is this interceding to me that I wouldn't destroy them. Please, God, hold back your wrath. I know we're sinners. Forgive us. Amen. But he says, I found them. He didn't find anybody that was interceding on behalf of Israel. So he wouldn't bring down his judgments. And he says, verse 31, Therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. So, again, very clear. Our prayers play a major role in our personal life, in the church, and even in the world. Amen. Because those angels are holding back the winds. And when we intercede to God for situations, when, you know, the, say we say, oh, pray for these people over here, or something, or like the earthquake, pray for the folks that, in the earthquake. We may think, oh, okay, yeah, we should probably... No. <laughs> Pray for them. And God will be with them. Our prayers are a major factor there. Um, one of the authors that's written a lot on prayer, Wesley Duell, wrote, Satan fears prayer more than almost anything else we could ever do. Prevailing prayer is potentially the greatest continuing threat to Satan that there has been since Calvary. Wow. Nothing will please him more than to get you to stop or neglect a strategic prayer request. Hold on. If Satan is fighting, your persevering in prayer is worth all that it costs. So you want to make Satan tremble? Pray. Ellen White wrote this, there is a mighty power in prayer our great adversary is constantly seeking to keep the troubled soul away from God <clears throat> and appeal to heaven by the humblest saint is more to be dreaded by Satan than the decrees of cabinets or of mandates of kings. That's pretty powerful. <laughs> That's very powerful. You know, God also says in Isaiah 56, 7 that my house should be called a house of prayer. As individuals, we're the temple of God. We should be individually 
in, you know, individuals in prayer. Um, however, God leads you in that. Um, and I will tell you this, Satan will attack your prayer life probably more than anything else. Amen. You know, it may, it's probably easier to sit down and spend 15, 20 minutes reading the Bible than praying for 15 or 20 minutes. He'll attack you there. But that's okay. Persevere through it. And I'll say this, I've, sometimes when you're working with young Christians and teaching them to pray and so forth, you might tell them, <clears throat> start for five minutes. Just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to kneel down here, or if you're not able to kneel, I'm going to sit in this chair, whatever. A position that's comfortable and quiet, I'm going to talk to God for five minutes. Then maybe then a few days later, you know, do it every day. Okay, I'm going to extend it to ten. So you start learning how to be a little longer. And you know what's going to happen? Next thing you know, you spend 30, 35, 40, 60 minutes in prayer. But it, it starts developing. In our life. As a church, it's so important that we facilitate prayer as much as possible. I, God's blessed our church here. Yes. And I attribute that blessing to prayer. And I'm not kidding when I say I'm not just using words. I truly believe that. And and so I, you know, we've looked how can we facilitate more prayer? And I appreciate I is our prayer coordinator. Um, where, you know, we, we have um, every Sabbath morning at 8.45, at 8.55, a group meets for prayer to pray for the church, Sabbath school church for that day. Is that important? Yes. <laughs> that enables God to come in power. See? Then also, Ike always comes to me and prays with me uh, for our services, and I appreciate that. Personal no prayer. We also have the... Um, the garden prayer before our prayer meeting here uh, from 10 to 10.30. If, if some of you have time and, and you'd like to just have some prayer time down in our West Wing, um, IT leads out in a garden prayer there. Also, um, we have our prayer bowls. If any of you have gone in our sanctuary and you've noticed, we have, it's, like, it's supposed to be a golden bowl on the right. We encourage our members to put their prayer requests in there on a little slip of paper. And then we encourage all our members every day, pray for the prayers that's in that prayer bowl. Amen. And we've had some answers because you've got to look on the other side of the platform, there's a clear bowl, and you're going to see slips of paper in there. That's answered prayer. So, and, and also we have our prayer calendar. At the end of the month, you get it for the new month. It has the names of church members on every day. And we encourage our members who get the calendar to pray for those people for that day. And so at, by the time the month's over, everyone that's on that prayer calendar will be prayed for at least once Amen. on that. And we've also got, um, Ike has started a um, prayer partner. He's encouraged folks to team up, and some of you have done that. So we're just praying for God to lead us even more. The more prayer, you heard me say it many times, the more prayer, the more, more power. power. <laughs> That's how it works. And so God's leading us. We really want to become a house of prayer. And interceding for one another, a prayer intercession. That's very important. Um, praying for one another. Paul tells us that at the end of the armor of God. Um, he says, uh, praying in all prayer and supplication in the spirit for the saints. So. We're to pray for one another, pray for our family members, pray for inactive members. The Hebrew word intercession is P-A-G-H-A, -A -A. It can mean to meet, to push against, to attack, to urge a request, or to make peace. <laughs> All the meanings of that word. So, when you're interceding for others, you're asking God to bring them at peace with God. That's what you're doing. Bring a meeting between them and God and, and bring peace. You're asking God to break the relationship, attack that relationship between them and Satan. Amen. Break that relationship. And you see that in um, with Peter. Remember Jesus said, uh, uh, Peter... Uh, Satan wants to have you and sift you as weeds. And then what did he say? I prayed for you. 
Let him pray for him. That's the only way Peter would have been protected. So he was doing intercessory prayer that the Holy Spirit would come in and break, get in the way, hinder, stop the full, you know, not. Peter failed, but he didn't fail utterly, completely. He came out. And so when we're praying for people that, you know, yeah, there may be failure, but as with Peter, come out on the other side. <clears throat> so very important. Uh, there's the, the Lord's Prayer for us in John 17. Um, let me go ahead and read that one. And he says he doesn't pray for the disciples only, but all of us that will believe on, on him through them. John 17, 15. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. Christ interceded back then. And he says also when you go to verse 29, I'm praying not only for them, but others that would believe. Christ prayed for you and me 2,000 years ago in that prayer. It also says he's interceding now. You know that? He ever lives to make intercession. <laughs> Remember God works through a man, human. Guess what? Christ is human. Amen. We have Christ, the second Adam, at the very presence of the Father. Remember God works through man. He's working through man, Jesus Christ, to intercede for us. So you're being prayed for every day by Christ. Also talks about the Holy Spirit making intercession for you. You got a lot on your side, folks. <laughs> We're not alone in this thing. And then we pray for one another as well. <clears throat> Ellen White wrote, she says, The Lord will hear the prayers uh, for the conversion of souls. And uh, she says also, Their persevering prayers will bring souls to the cross. In cooperation with their self-sacrificing efforts, Jesus will move upon the hearts of with miracles, working miracles for the conversion of souls. Also, there's this text over here in 2 Corinthians. Um, I'll read this to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians 4. Okay, this is talking about Paul writing about the gospel and some are not receiving it. He says in verse 3 and 4, but even if our gospel is veiled, I want you to remember that word veiled. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So as long as the gospel is veiled from somebody, they will perish. Whose minds the God of this world, of this age, we know that is Satan, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Satan has a veil mm -hmm. over the eyes of those who do not see the gospel. The light is not penetrating that veil. The Greek word for veil is kalupsis. <clears throat> K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. Kalupsis. That means a veiling. Hiding. <clears throat> now, if you put a prefix on it, <clears throat> A-P-O, apo, apokalupsis, it means an unveil. Removing that veil. Apocalypse. Some Bibles call the book of Revelation the apocalypse, right? The unveiling. So when you intercede, and you can you can refer to this text when you pray, you can pray and say, Lord, who are you praying for? It appears that Satan has this veil. They can't see. I ask you, Lord. Remove that veil. See? And, and that's why you've heard me say numerous times. Many times folks don't need more information, they need revelation. That's an apocalypse. An unveiling. So when they hear, 
they can hear the same words that maybe you shared before, but if God has removed the veil, now they see what you're really talking about. It gets through. And so that's part of the intercession that we do. That's the reason for it. And a text I really like along this line is 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. This is the Living Bible. I like how it puts it. He says here, these weapons, our weapons, spiritual weapons, these weapons can break down proud arguments against God. And every wall that can be built up to keep men from finding Him, like those veils. See, our weapons <laughs> can break them down and remove that veil. With these weapons, I can capture rebels and bring them back to God and change them into men whose heart's desire is obedience to Christ. So there's a promise. You can go to that scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, and you can pray that. Or so and so. They may have arguments on this and that, the other thing against God. You talk to them, it's like a brick ball you can't get through. You go to the scripture. Remember, prayer releases the power of the word and the power of the spirit. So when you go to the scripture and you can pray it, God, cast down these imaginations and thoughts and whatever's there that's keeping them from knowing you. Remove that veil. See, these are very targeted prayers that you're interceding for that person. And in that, what are you doing? You're giving God permission that he wouldn't have otherwise. But that's so important to realize. <clears throat> and then, um, I, I, I like, you know, we have our prayer bowls. I'll just share a little bit on that with you. Um, Revelation 5.8, this is where the idea comes from. <laughs> it's in the Bible. <clears throat> Revelation 5.8 says, Now, when he had taken the, the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls. Okay, see that? Golden bowls in heaven, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, Every prayer you have ever prayed is in a golden bowl in heaven. Now the incense, remember in the, in the sanctuary there was the altar of incense. The incense represents the righteousness of Christ. So his pure righteousness is mingled with your prayers. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. You see, if we come to God in prayer and just pray in ourselves, that's not going to go too far. That's why I emphasize, when you pray, pray in the name of Christ. Amen. When you're in your prayer. Now, some people think it's old-fashioned. I don't. There's theology behind this. Now, you may offer up a quick prayer and not have opportunity. <laughs> you know, uh, God understands that. But if you're doing a major prayer, you know, it's good to remember that in Jesus' name. You, that's that incense. You're, you're letting the incense of Jesus ascend to God. His righteousness ascend to God. And your prayers then are going into the golden bowl with the incense. Because it says incense is there. The righteousness of Jesus. So every prayer you've ever prayed is in a golden bowl. Now, just to show you um, another text here. Uh, Revelation 8, verse 3 to 5. Then another angel, having golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, <clears throat> that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints, there's an incense again, upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. <clears throat> And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it into the earth. And there were noises, thunders, lightnings, and earthquake. Okay, what's fire a symbol of? The Holy Spirit. Remember John said, I baptize you with water, but he that's coming shall baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. When you pray, 
in answer to your prayer, the fire is loose. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is is free then to go and to go and do whatever you pray. Uh, to me, it's good to have these visuals of uh, basically how it works. And um, I'm, I'll close with uh, this one statement by Ellen White. There's going to be a great reformatory movement, reformation in the church. She said, in visions of the night, representations pass before me of a great reformatory movement among God's people. Many were praising God, the sick were healed, other miracles were wrought. Now here's what I want you to get out of what we're studying today. A spirit of intercession was seen, even as was manifested before the great day of Pentecost. So as a part of that great last revival and reformation, prayer, the, the church will be saturated with Spirit, like she said, the day of Pentecost, uh, individually and as a church. So, two very important experiences for us then is certainly to be men and women of prayer and to be filled with the Spirit. And uh, next time, we're going to take some time on, on the Holy Spirit. That is from uh, 9126, 9 Testament. Okay, now I want us to go through the lesson. We got time to review the lesson, see what yeah. you came up with, Dennis. and we can have some discussion. Yes. Where did you get that again? Or, 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 uh, that last quote. That last quote is nine, uh, volume nine of the testimonies. One twenty-six. <laughs> okay. Testimonies. Nine testimonies. One twenty-six. Okay. Let's see. Now you got your. Everyone got a lesson now. Maybe some came in a little later. Anyone not have the lesson? Raise your hand. Everybody's got the lesson. Okay, except the young guy up here. <laughs> okay. Let's see what we got here. And lesson one. Why should we pray? Why was Satan called the god of this world in the New Testament? Well. God gave Adam dominion, rulership in this world. Adam gave this dominion and rulership to Satan. <clears throat> when he yielded to Satan's temptation in the Garden of Eden. Is that, is that clear now to everybody? You, you see that concept, that principle? Okay. <laughs> Thankful. Some of you are right now, we get a little water here. Satan. Everything Satan does works against him, against Satan. Uh, he's got to be frustrated at times, um, which is good. <laughs> Satan did everything he could to separate man from God. Because he saw that, you know, I know my sermon last Sabbath, you know, God created us, to, we're a special creation. He, he created us to be very close to God. And then when sin came in, oh, phew, Satan thought, okay, I took care of that. Separate man from God. Well, what happens? Man becomes even closer to God than he would have been before at the beginning because now God has become man. Amen. You know? 
So it's amazing. And that's what took place. God became one of us. And Christ will be human throughout eternity. Very close to us. Why is prayer an essential part of being a Christian? Well, it's for our own personal growth. Two parts. Our own growth and advancing God's work. Prayer has been compared well, I'll back up a minute. Reading the Bible has been compared to eating. You know, eat the word. There's a scripture that talks about that. Compared to eating. you got to eat every day. So we want to study the word every day. Do you know what prayer has been compared to in the physical realm? Breathing. 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 Now you don't take one breath in the morning and stop breathing, right? <laughs> it wouldn't last long. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. It means we pray and keep an attitude of prayer. When you're driving here today, you know, you're talking to God, you're driving, you know, you just keep an attitude. That's me. You're always talking spiritual things. You're talking other stuff. But you're always connected through, through that attitude of prayer. And, and the moment something happens, you just naturally... Go there to prayer. When I was in Indonesia the first time, I go. Uh, Satan tried to put some fear in my heart because the terrorists had just blown up the Australian embassy and they blown up the Marriott Hotel in Jakarta. And um, you know, Satan wanted me to be a little afraid that you, know, you go there, uh, something might happen to you. So I went to prayer, and I was praying uh, before I left, and, and the Lord brought to my mind um, where Christ said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Oh, yeah. Every square inch of Indonesia is under the authority of Jesus. I don't have to worry about anything. But see, prayer. God uses prayer to, uh, to speak to us. And also, it may be a quick prayer, when I got there, I, I met a lady. She actually heard her husband kind of host take me around <clears throat> to the places I was going to speak. And she worked in the office building right by the Australian embassy. And, you know, glass windows and all. And when the uh, terrorists blew up the Australian embassy, of course, the blast blew out up toward her office. And it shattered all the windows. And there was glass flying all through the room. She stood up and she said, Jesus save me. Now that's a pretty quick prayer. It wasn't formal. Not one piece of glass hit her. So God is amazing. What he can do. Um, and then she went running downstairs. Well, as ladies often do, she'd taken her shoes off in the office. Then when she got downstairs to the lobby, she realized she didn't have her shoes on and there was glass all over the lobby. She was going to go back up to get her shoes, but there was a man there who said, Here, he carried her across the lobby outside to safety, put her down, and she turned and he was gone. Wow. So, you know who that was. <laughs> So we don't have to have a long prayer. It, it could be a short prayer, uh, but it's essential for our, 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 our personal growth and protection. If you get woke up some night in your sleep and someone's mind is just really on you, you better pray for them. God may not say what to pray for, but you best pray for them. You see? That's, it's, that's how it works. We pray and it's for protection and we don't know always what it's about. And advancing God's work. That's why as a church, we're, we're asking God to lead us to facilitate as much prayer as we can. Because this church will only grow and be blessed as we are a praying church. That's the only way it'll happen. And so, we'll, that's, how, that's how God set it up. Well, if that's the rules, we better play by the rules. And, and God will bless why is prayer necessary in 
is simply not simply a privilege for the Christian. Well, yeah. Because when God wants to do something, necessary for man to pray for God. <coughs> Remember we had we had the examples of that. God intervened for Peter. Jesus prayed for him. Pray for laborers. Yeah. Actually, that's in this. List two Old Testament examples of necessity of prayer. <coughs> Elijah praying for rain. No rain and praying for rain. Why do you think it took seven times to get the rain to come? You know what I think? I didn't say this, but Satan wanted to destroy them. You know, Satan has power over the elements. You know that. You look at Job. Remember everything Job lost? That was because of Satan. God gave Satan permission to do this stuff. So Satan can control the elements, weather, nature, to the extent God gives him permission to. Okay? So when the drought came, of course, that was hard on Israel, and if it, if it, would, it, would, be, if it would never stop, there'd be no crops, and you know, they'd be destroyed. I don't think Satan wanted to let it go. So, maybe that power, evil, good, back and forth. The more Elijah prayed, the more it released the power of God and finally broke the power of Satan. And the rain came. That's what I said. It doesn't necessarily say the Bible, but I think you get, uh, you can come to that conclusion. Also, <clears throat> Remember in Ezekiel where God didn't want to pour out his judgments on Israel, but he couldn't find a man that was asking God not to. <laughs> I had one strange experience with that. Like that. Um, I guess it's connected to two things. Um, when we were living in Connecticut many years ago, I had a dream that was so vivid that um, we were watching a news program in the morning coming out of New York in the dream. And all of a sudden, I, you could tell there was an earthquake happening. And you could see the people, you know, were starting to panic what we were going to do. And it was so vivid, I almost woke Patty up to tell her about it. Now I better let her sleep. Um, that's one thing. Uh, then one time I was in my office, and, and this is getting to the part of God holding back the judgment. All of a sudden, I had an intense dread that an earthquake was going to hit New York. Just, I, I've never had that before, or since. Intense dread, like it's going to happen. And I'm sure there are other Christians that might have had that at that time too. I don't know. And I was compelled to pray. Lord, no, 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 don't, don't let an earthquake hit New York. No. no. Was that just me? Uh, you know. But I'll tell you this, knowing what I know, if I get that kind of conviction, then I'm going to pray. Yes. Because, you know, there will be times New York will get hit. We know what just happened out in California. So, yeah, those will happen. And, uh, Praying can, can intercede. You know, a lot of non-Christians make fun of Christians, but I'll tell you this, it's because of Christians that things are going as good as it is in the world. It's because of the prayers of Christians. And that's why we should be praying for our leaders, that God will be with them and give them wisdom. I don't care what party we're a member of or whoever leaders we like or we don't like. The Bible says God puts them in there and uh, let's pray for them. That's the important thing. And, and as Paul says, pray for them that we may live a peaceful life. Yeah, good. And even in world events, as Christians, we need to pray about world events. Says God brings them to your mind. Um, there may be things He wants to do in the world, and He starts putting on the heart of certain Christians to pray in a certain way for those things. Now, there's, there's a reason for that. 
And then uh, look at the new verse, uh, New Testament verses that illustrate this. It's a necessity of prayer. Where uh, the Lord's Prayer, that God's will be done. Praying for our daily bread. Because he asked them to do that. Every now and then, it's, it's good to, to recall how blessed we are in this country. Amen. It's because of God. Because we see some countries, well, you know, you, you see, and I think of people like in Syria, where there's such, and I don't know all the politics behind that, but I know there's people suffering there. And there's people that they don't have daily bread. I'm sure every one of us can go home and we could probably go a month without going to the grocery store and still survive. <laughs> Got a lot of food in our cupboard probably. <laughs> At least if you're like me, you do. Um, but yeah, it's we're very blessed. I was just in a grocery store the other day walking around and you know, getting stuff in the basket and seeing other people looking at this and that. And across the money, and Lord, I thank you. We can go to a grocery store and get basically whatever we need. It's good to have that attitude of thankfulness in our heart. And, and express it to them. And then also praying for laborers and sent to the harvest field. Paul said, pray for us for the gospel to advance. Clearly illustrate the necessity of prayer. Why does Satan fear most? What does he fear most in the Christian's life and why? Well, he fears brain Christians. Because it releases the power of God to work against him. It enables God to work in behalf of the Christian. And I really do believe we talked about intercession. I do believe every one of us are a Christian because somebody prayed for us. Yeah. Might have been a mother, father, aunt, friend. I, I don't know who, but I do believe that. Somewhere in your life, somebody prayed for you. And that's why you're a Christian. And probably more than one somebody. Yeah. <laughs> probably a number of people. What did God say his house would be called and what does that mean for the Christian? House of prayer, that's right. And this means every Christian and church should have prayer as the foundation of everything they do. Don't leave home without praying. Yeah. And uh, we drive out, we stop the car in the driveway <laughs> with us and watch over our house in Cooper. Keep Cooper safe too, you know. Yeah. Right for that. And I don't know if you've got this. Uh, sometimes I'm driving and I get a little sense. Now, I don't see anything that's dangerous, you know, no anything, but I get a sense that there may be danger and I offer a quick prayer. Lord be with me. You can, you know, if, if you get that when you're driving, don't ignore it. <laughs> be with me, dear Lord. Keep me safe. Don't have to pray a long prayer. But don't shut your eyes. And don't shut your eyes. That's right. <laughs> you can't pray with your eyes open. Oh, I bet that happened. You know, you don't want to be in something like this, but you've got the kind of car where you can, you know, it comes through the speaker. I've had time for someone to call and they need prayer, and I'll pray for them while I'm driving. You know, of course, I'm watching where I'm going. But I'm praying for them, too. So, yeah, no. <coughs> Like opportunities for prayer, especially if you've got a conviction to pray for someone. And what are two spiritual experiences the Christian is to have in order to be ready for Christ's return? Baptist Holy Spirit and prayer. And we'll be looking at the Baptist Holy Spirit in more detail next time. Okay. Any uh, questions? Very clear? Pardon? Yes, we will be having these on our website. Uh, we are video recording it. So we will have the lessons on the website and the videos in time. Yes, Larry.
I was, uh, when you were talking about that prayer for others, and I remember I just having to think about Abraham's prayer over uh, Solomon. Yeah, Abraham there staying with God over Sodom. You know, over 40, 30. Yeah. And yet, the prayer and everything was that something that saved a lot and uh, so the angels came and brought them out. I'm sure I did. I'm sure Abraham's intercession proved the salvation of Lot. Yes. Okay, so and if you don't know our website, it's Clearview, name of the church, sdachurch.org. You go there, you've got our all of our series that we've done there, and you're gonna have this and we'll find there. And if you would like to get the book, the books are available on the caddy. And it looks like lesson two is being handed out. That's good. We've got an efficient team. Uh, the website. Uh, can I have your attention for a moment? The web. The question is about the website. The website is Clearview S D A Church dot org. Okay. Well, let's have a prayer. I know some of you are passing those out. Let's pause for a moment and we'll pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to study. We do thank you, Father, for the wonderful gift of prayer that you've given us. Satan's tried to break our relationship with you, our communication with you, but Lord, you overruled that. And through prayer, we can talk to you, the great God of heaven. And not only talk with you, we, you can communicate back, of course, and prayer releases you to carry out your will. Thank you, Lord, for the honor that you've given us. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay.